What is going on everyone? My name is Andy. Welcome back to another FPL video. In this one it's transfer tips for game week 37, which is of course a double game week, but I've decided to do things a little bit different in this video. I know that the game week preview tomorrow, team selection and final thoughts on Friday, there's going to be a lot of questions and discussion around those double game week players. So for this one I've stuck to single game week players only that have two nice fixtures to end the season that you might want to look at if you want to go a little bit different to what everyone else is thinking this week. Most of the players I'm going to talk about are either low-owned or they've not been transferred in by that many people already so far this week. So if you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a like, hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already, and let's jump into it. So let's start off with Eze, because Crystal Palace have got two really nice fixtures to end the season, Fulham away and Nottingham Forest at home. And I know as we get towards the end, people like to focus on players and teams with something to play for. So it could be Golden Boots, League titles, European players, places or of course just not getting relegated and none of that really applies to Eze or Crystal Palace but I also think it doesn't really matter if you look at the results since Roy Hodgson came in they got those three wins straight away against Leicester Leeds and Southampton they then went on a run of four games where they drew 0-0 with Everton they lost 2-0 away to Wolves they just beat West Ham 4-3 at home and then they lost 1-0 to Spurs away now I suspect some people might have labeled them as on the beach after those four games because people love to use that label whenever they can but then even though they're safe they've gone and got a clean sheet against Bournemouth and scored another couple of goals so basically in most of the easier fixtures that Roy Hodgson has had they've won and scored plenty of goals in the process as well so I don't see why that won't continue over the next couple of games and also Fulham are in a very similar position where they don't really have anything to play for I think teams like that facing up against each other can sometimes be quite fun because the shackles are off there's no pressure whatsoever and especially when you're targeting in an attacker from those teams rather than a defender there is the potential for plenty of goals as well so I really like that fixture I also like Nottingham Forest at home on the last day of the season of course at that point We'll know what's happening in game week 37, how the relegation fight is shaping up. Nottingham Forest might need a point or a win from that game to ensure survival. But I still think it's a really good fixture for Crystal Palace. The last home game in front of their fans, you want to go out with a bang. It might also be Roy Hodgson's last game in charge. I'm not sure if he's going to go and manage many more teams. So there's a lot kind of, not riding on it, but lots of factors where there could be, you know, plenty of goals over the next couple of fixtures and if you're looking for a cheap midfielder outside of double game week players I don't think there's many better than Eze for 5.6 million or below of course if somehow you're not yet tripled up on Brighton then you could look at Brighton midfielders but I suspect you either already own them or you've just decided to go against them but for single game week players 5.6 million or below you know there could be like a punt on Ganacho or someone like that but I just don't think he's going to get enough starts it has to be Eze so 90,000 people have already brought him in so far this week that's going to continue to grow I know as someone that owns Rashford and might not have the money to upgrade him if I really want two free transfers in 38 I'll have to go for someone cheaper and Eze is really high up on my list I'd always prefer to go for a double game weaker but if it's not possible he's probably the one to bring in for 5.6 so Harry Kane has scored 27 league goals so far this season and yet from an FPL point of view it feels like most of us have just forgotten about him because Spurs haven't had any double game weeks and I think generally there's just a lack of funds or transfers for most people to easily be able to get him back into their squads and because of that I think it makes him a great differential. Now don't get me wrong his overall ownership is 29% but I think if you check active managers especially those in the top 10k or the top 100k it's going to be much lower and for that you get a player that's been super consistent 6.7 points per match over the entire season only beaten by Haaland and yes they've got no double game week but you get pretty much a guarantee of 160 to 180 minutes across the final two games of Brentford at home and Leeds away and Brentford are a good team but that is Spurs final home game of the season right I think that is a fixture they can get goals in and then Leeds away final day obviously once we've seen game week 37 we'll know what the relegation battle looks like but Leeds are either going to be safe nothing to play for not a bad game for Kane to get more goals or they're going to be fighting might need a point might need a win 
Things could get cagey. The pressure could be on if they can see. They might have to go for it. Either way, Harry Kane is going to be gunning for goals in both of those games because that's what he always does. If you want a player in a team with something to play for, Spurs, yes, they're not going to get Champions League places. There's still a battle for the Europa League places. And Harry Kane just always wants to score. There's always something that he is chasing. He's only three goals from 30 for the season. He obviously wants that Premier League record uh, that is currently held by Alan Shearer as well. So despite how Spurs might have been playing over this entire season or the last few weeks of all the management changes, despite what might happen in the summer if Kane leaves or if he doesn't, I don't think it's really going to matter to his potential to score goals over the last couple of games. So I don't think you need to rip your teams apart to get him in. Obviously, there's a big double game week to think about this week as well. But if you're happy with the rest of the team and you've got an easy move to get him in that doesn't involve selling Haaland, then I really like the idea of bringing him back. If you're someone that wants to go really different then obviously with the same two fixtures you've got son he is 11.5 minutes it's so hard to justify that but i think in some ways a lot of the fpl not rules but the way that people play in terms of looking for value targeting fixtures going with consistency some of that goes out the window when you get to the final two game weeks of the season and some people might just need a massive differential to fire them up the ranks so obviously salary is brilliant and i definitely think salary is better than son for the final two games but his ownership is really high and if you want to go a little bit different you've got a son who we know what the quality is from him even if he hasn't shown it for most of this season with two pretty good fixtures in Brentford at home and Leeds away so you could look at him as well I know most people aren't going to go for that but like I said we're talking about differentials now Kane is the one to get him from Spurs if you can but if it's easier to get a midfielder and like I said you want to go different maybe Hyung Min Son is the way to go so first of all I know that Calvert-Lewin is currently yellow flagged in FPL with a groin issue and of course if Sean Dyche rules him out you shouldn't be looking to buy him but I'm hopeful that the substitution against Man City at half time was just a precaution and that he will be available for Everton's final two games of Wolves away and Bournemouth at home. And he is someone that I'm potentially looking to buy in game week 38. Now, with Everton's current situation, they're fighting to stay in the Premier League. They're in a relegation battle. The fixtures could always be more perfect, but I think in this case, they could also be a lot worse. They're about to face two teams with nothing much to play for. And I know Wolves don't concede a huge amount of goals. That's not going to be an easy fixture. That's not what I'm saying. But I think Everton will draw some positivity from their recent results, especially since Calvert-Lewin has been back in the side. Look, they've just lost to Man City. Who doesn't lose to Man City? I'm not really worried about that. The previous two games were both away, and they've scored seven goals against Brighton and Leicester. And even the game before that, against a difficult Newcastle side, yes, okay, it's a really bad result, losing 4-1 at home. But they've also scored in that game as well. So since Calvert-Lewin has been back in the side, they've scored eight goals in five games. But one of them was Man City, where he came off at half time against a team that don't concede a huge amount of goals anyway. So I think they've looked better. They're not obviously world beaters or anything like that, but it's a huge positive if he's available. And I think for that reason, you can definitely consider him as a punt for one of, if not both, of the final game weeks of the season. He's only 0.3% owned overall. And I know what people are going to say, for 7.9 million, he's absolutely not worth it. And I would agree if we had like another six to eight game weeks to go. But again, people are going to be looking at punts for the final couple of weeks of the season. And we know what he is capable of. He has had a really bad time with injuries. Like we look at this season, he's hardly played. He's got, what is it, two goals, one assist for the whole season. Last year, it was five five goals two assists but before that when he was fit when he was playing regularly he had a 16 goal season and a 13 goal season so we know what he's capable of and he has the fixtures and that's all there really is to it if you want to go for like an Alvarez punt for Man City for the double or a Martial punt for Man United of course they are worth looking at Newcastle attackers Isaac and Wilson have got Leicester at home this week the way that Newcastle have played for most of this season those two forwards with Leicester at home and Chelsea away could potentially score more points than Calvert-Lewin nobody is saying this is a dead cert but I think it's something to consider if you've got the money and if there's no other forwards that you really want to go for especially those with double gaming so I don't think there's a rush to bring him in or anything like that and I'm probably not going to do it for Wolves away but Bournemouth at home if I want a one week punt and it's him versus a Jesus versus a Newcastle forward away to Chelsea and he's fit 
he's probably the one that I would go for. All right, let's talk about Odegaard and Arsenal players in general, because I think a lot of FPL managers would have earmarked game week 37 as a pretty good time to bring some of their players back in, because they're going to end the season with Forest away and Wolves at home. And we know what this Arsenal side is capable of. They can easily score multiple go uh, goals in both of those games. And output is not really a major concern. Odegaard is on 5.9 points per match for the entire season. That's only beaten by De Bruyne and Salah. I just wonder if there's other factors at play here now given the league is basically over i know mathematically it's not but we all know man city are going to win it and i'm sure the arsenal players realize that as well so will there be more rotation and how will the players react now in terms of the starting 11 i don't think we're going to see a huge amount of changes from arteta for either of those games it's not mathematically over so i think the usual suspects odegaard jesus saka etc will start that game obviously on the left it depends on the injury to martinelli trossard could play in instead but it's going to be a very similar setup and then you go into game week 38 where the league probably will be over by that point but it's the final home game you've had a fantastic season of course Arsenal players and fans are going to be massively disappointed they couldn't hold on but it's still been a great season you want to go out with a bang so why not let the players that got you to that point start again what I do think we will probably see is earlier substitutions for some of the players that maybe didn't get a huge amount of minutes over the season so the likes of like Reese Nelson Fabio Vieira Smith Rowe maybe in Ketia as well perhaps instead of coming on like the 80 85th minute whether they're winning or losing perhaps they start coming on 60 65 70 or something like that so that's what I think we will see I could be massively wrong he might just go and rotate in both of those games but I think the likes of Odin are going to be fairly safe in terms of reaction I think after the Brighton game any interview the Arsenal players or manager gave afterwards you could see how deflated they were they know it's over but they've had a bit of time to maybe try and realize they've still had a good season and you don't just want to go out with a whimper you want to show the fans that this is going to be what happens again next season and like I said it's not completely over so I think they will go and get goals in both uh, both games and therefore they're still going to be good options to us from an FPL point of view. They maybe just have to get those points a little bit earlier if we're going to see those substitutions. So I guess at that point it depends what kind of money you've got to spend. Like I've already spoken about Eze and what a great cheap option he is. If you've got 6.8 million there's probably not too many better players than Odegaard. If you've got your pick of Arsenal players I do find it difficult to turn down a penalty taker so I would probably still rate Saka as the best option but if you're looking at underlying numbers expected goals and expected assists per 90 minutes where Odegaard comes out at 0.3 xg 0.23 expected assists he's actually slightly better than Saka so it really is just the penalties that kind of swing it for me to Saka's side I, I guess what I would say is I wouldn't go out of my way to find the money for Saka. If you've only got 6.8 million, you haven't got a good way to raise more funds, then Odegaard is a, a perfectly sound pick. And I just think with Martinelli, there's just probably no point in taking the risk because even if that's not a major injury you don't want to make it worse especially when Trossard could play instead so I think you're really looking at Odegaard or Saka or of course if you need a forward then someone like Jesus but I wouldn't be surprised to start seeing Nketiah come on a little bit earlier in both of those games he's only played 16 minutes across Brighton and Newcastle I suspect he'll probably play at least 20 minutes in one of those games if not maybe both as well uh, so let's see what happens I, I think for Arsenal it's going to be massive disappointment but for FPL I don't think it changes a huge amount if you'd already targeted their players and there's no one else that you need to go and buy I still think it's perfectly fine to bring them in this week let me know below what you're doing are you just ignoring Arsenal now that the league is over are you going to go for someone else what about all the other players I've discussed are any of them on your list to bring in or is there someone else you're going for instead leave me a comment below give the video a like if you enjoyed it hit that subscribe button and i'll catch you again tomorrow